This morning we're going to be in Isaiah chapter 37. And the last time the message was titled Physical and Spiritual Healing, and we saw pictures of both of those. Uh, this morning the title is When Tragedy Strikes, right? Uh, Warren Wearsby said that tragedy doesn't make a person, but it reveals what a person is made of. And it is, in this time in Israel's history, it was tough. You know, the Assyrian Empire before the Babylonians had come down. Um, they were just conquering everybody. Nobody could withstand the Assyrians. Um, we know about the Romans and the Greeks, but we don't realize that siege warfare happened even earlier than that. They made these mountains of the debris, and they would even, were able to get into walled cities. So God's people were terrified. Uh, the citizens of Jerusalem were frightened. The king was frightened too, and boy, he really had to, to, um, to call on God. He really had to reach out to God. And we're going to look at that when tragedy strikes. Now, okay, so maybe for you personally, and, and my Wednesday night crew has heard this before because there is some overlap in Isaiah and 2 Kings. There's about three chapters where there's an overlap. So some of you have heard some of this, although I'm going to change it up a little bit. Uh, 2 Kings comes from a more historical perspective, and Isaiah comes from more of a spiritual perspective. And as believers, we may not have a uh, 100,000 people surrounding our house, but we may be dealing with things and trials and tragedies, and, and, and how do we respond? You know, uh, what do we do? What's the first thing that we do? Uh, but I believe that as we go through this message, you'll really be blessed because you can see how God's people did it back then, and not all of them. A lot of them failed, uh, but thank God that the leadership did the right thing because that had an effect a cascading effect on their constituents, so to speak. So we're going to look at this in seven parts. And starting in verse 1, it says, And so it was when King Hezekiah heard it, he heard the threats. They were surrounded. The Reb Sheka, who was the field commander, uh, he was uh, telling the cabinet, what he was going to do to them. He was loud so the people on the wall could hear and be fearful and defect. All right, so all these things happened in context. When King Hezekiah hears what happens, his cabinet comes back and tells him, he tore his clothes, covered himself with sackcloth, and went into the house of the Lord. Then he sent Eliakim, who was over the household, Shebna the scribe, and the elders of the priests, covered with sackcloth to Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos. And they said to him, Thus says Hezekiah, This day is a day of trouble and rebuke and blasphemy, for the children have come to birth, but there is no strength to bring them forth. It may be that the Lord your God will hear the words of the Rabshakeh, whom his master, the king of Assyria, has sent to reproach the living God and will reprove the words which the Lord your God has heard. Therefore, lift up your prayer for the remnant that is left. So one out of seven is, is King Hezekiah's response to the threats of the Assyrians, to the threats of the Rabshakeh. And we saw this in chapter 36. And this is really a model for any believer as we go through these points. So A, he tore his clothes, his cabinet tore their clothes, and put sackcloth on. So we have to bring, bring you back a few thousand years of uh, cultural differences. This was a sign of grief. This was a sign of mourning. They were emotionally stricken. And sometimes that's our first response to a tragedy because we're human. It's that sympathetic nervous system response, that fight or flight, that, that jolt of adrenaline, that fear, you know, what am I going to do at this point? It's a scary thing, and we go through that as human beings. But let's look at what happened next. B, he goes to the temple to pray. And this must be, as believers, you know, we, we get that, it's, it's kind of a weird thing where the body kind of does its own thing, the adrenaline, the, the chemicals in the brain, but there's, there's, we're also spirit. And we have to, at some point, say, you know what, we, I, need, I know where I need to go with this. My body wants to fight or run, but I know that I need to control my body, and I need to seek the Lord. So after that initial response, he, they go right to the Lord, which is an awesome thing. See, he sends his men to see the prophet Isaiah, and you see two concepts here that we often see in, in Scripture, that there's uh, safety in a multitude of counsel. Sometimes we make the wrong decisions when we're alone and our thoughts get the best of us. 
when we're not in a good emotional place and our thoughts just keep running through and, and you, sometimes you need to bounce those thoughts off of somebody. In addition, corporate prayer, right? This is what we try to do at the church as well. On Sundays, on uh, Wednesdays, uh, during men's events and women's events, we get together and we pray. We pray. I actually, it's a little bit of an aside, but on my Facebook wall, when I had done some research, I started somewhere, I moved to the CDC stats and found in 2016, 45,000, those numbers are correct, Americans took their lives by suicide. And I put out an appeal on Facebook just to say, listen, if you're struggling, if you have these thoughts, and this is what happens when we're alone, we have this idea, some people have this idea that their life isn't worth anything, and they start moving from that point and end up in a tragedy, not realizing so many people would be affected by that decision. So I don't say it critically, I say it uh, encouraging, and to me, at least to be, inbox me, somebody, just talk to me, I'll talk to you. But definitely seek help because, you know, it's not, it's, you don't want to throw your life away. People do love you. You are worthwhile. You are valuable. So you see this, this uh, group of people coming together with the same focus. We got to get to God here because this is really, really bad. And D, as we look at it, they, the prayer to God is basically, God, do you see what they're saying about you? Because yes, the enemy was saying, we're going to come in, we're going to kill you, we're going to torture you, we're going to starve you before we come in. But they also um, attack God himself. Your God can't save you. And then some of the blasphemous things that the enemy said about th the true God. And we'll see what God's response is. And again, D is, is when a problem is too big for us, we give it to God. Listen, there's a lot of God gave us a big brain. There's a lot of little nonsensical decisions we make every day that I'm sure the, that God is not terribly concerned about. I got up this morning. I could have worn the green shirt or the pink shirt, but I got this for Father's Day, so I wore the pink shirt. Don't think there's any spiritual implications one way or the other, unless, of course, anybody stumbled by the pink shirt. But uh, for the most part, we can make simple decisions. Uh, and, and God does care about if you're really struggling that much with the color of your shirt. I'm sure he can help you out, but... <laughs> I'm going too long on the shirt thing. <laughs> but the bottom line is that God really wants to, listen, a life-changing decision. You're going through something, you're deciding something, it's a life-changing decision. Those decisions, we really need to bring to God. I mean, I think I'm relatively intelligent, but um, when, when there's a, a decision like that, I want God involved in the process. I want to seek his counsel. So we continue. Verse 3 there's a colloquialism back then that says that the child is ready to be born, um, and it sounds weird when we read it because, you know, we're not from that culture. But what it means is that the child is ready to be born, but the mother is too exhausted to actually deliver the child. What a tragedy that would be. And this was the expression they were using for the tragedy and the trial that they were currently involved in. Okay, verse 5. It says, So the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah, and Isaiah said to them, Thus shall you say to your master, Thus says the Lord, Do not be afraid of the words which you have heard, with which the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. This is God speaking through Isaiah. Surely I will ascend a spirit upon him, and he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. So two out of seven is I, Isaiah's comforting words. And, and I paraphrase a lot. You see what it says in the scripture, but in other words, he's saying to the people, he's saying to the leaders, don't worry, God has your back. He, he's with you, uh, he sees everything that's going on, and he's going to deal with the situation. Uh, and again, Hezekiah the king had no idea that God was going to wipe out a substantial part of the Assyrian army, right? And this is a good lesson for us as believers, to trust God in all situations, now, we can fret about a lot of things in life. We can fret about this and worry about that. But we don't know God's plans for deliverance. We don't know what his, you know, what his future plans are, you know, even in, in our own lives. And that's the issue. You know, we look at the planet as like, oh, I don't know, over 7 billion people on the earth. And almost kind of by comparison, we see ourselves as, as insignificant. But God is amazing. He has the ability to be in the, involved in the lives of billions of people on the planet. I mean, talk about a multitasker. That is our God. So don't ever look at yourself as insignificant. 
But I want to digress for a moment. Who is this Isaiah? Well, we know he was just a man. He wasn't Superman. As a matter of fact, sadly, at the end of his life, he spoke uh, God's word so much that the next leadership after Hezekiah was wicked, and they ended up, his own people ended up killing him. So he wasn't invincible. He wasn't superhuman. But this guy was amazing. This guy was solid. This guy was a rock. The whole king in his cabinet looked to Isaiah. Isaiah, you got to talk to the Lord for us because really we don't even know what to do at this point. All's going to be lost. And I got to say, the world needs more Isaiahs. It needs more Isaiahettes. You know, it needs more leaders that are going to be that in tune with God that others will notice it. Will that be you? Will that be you? And in my opening, I spoke about uh, Father's Day and men stepping up as leader because unfortunately in this world, and we see it in even professions, a lot of men are wishy-washy. They can't make decisions, you know, and, and I don't think it's any coincidence that our, our culture is more and more turning its back on God. I mean, I see a direct relationship there, definitely. Anything good that I am, and Pastor Vinny said it on Friday night, I, I echo his sentiments. Anything good that I am is because it's God in me. Because most of you, my wife knows, but most of you didn't know me before I was uh, saved. So we'll, we'll leave that for another time. Uh, but verse 7, it says, He, the king of Assyria, shall hear a rumor and return home. And I'm going to address this in the next section. Verse 8, we continue. So the Rabshakeh, the field commander for the Assyrians, returned and found the king of Assyria, his boss, warring against Libna, for he had heard that he had departed from Lashish. And these are Jerusalem, Libna, Lashish. These are towns that Assyria was looking to conquer. Some he did, some he did not. Well, Jerusalem was the one that he didn't. Verse 9, And the king heard concerning Tirhaka, king of Ethiopia. He has come out to make war with you. So he hears this rumor. He hears this thing. So when he heard it, he sent messengers to Hezekiah saying, Okay, so Assyria is kind of panicking. They don't want to fight a two-front war. You know, it's a simple military understanding. It's not a good idea to fight a war on two fronts. However, they don't want to lose Jerusalem. So they sent messengers back to King Hezekiah again, saying, Thus you shall speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah, saying, Do not let your God in whom you trust deceive you, saying, Jerusalem will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Look, you have heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all the lands by utterly destroying them, and will you be delivered? Have the gods of the nations delivered those whom my fathers have destroyed, Gozan and Haran and Rezef, and the people of Eden who are in Telassar? Where is the king of Hamath, the king of Arpad, the king of the city of Serviam, Hena and Iva? And Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it, and Hezekiah went to the house of the Lord, and he spread it. They were usually in the form of a scroll. He spread it out before the Lord. Then Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, saying, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, the one who dwells between the cherubim, speaking of how God said his physical presence would be in the temple, right on top of the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies, between the carved out angels or cherubim. You are God, you alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. And hear all the words of Sennacherib, which was the king of Assyria, who has sent to reproach the living God. Truly, Lord, this is amazing because he's having a conversation with God. I mean, he's talking to God. You know, Jesus was very clear about, in the New Testament, about repeating prayers over and over again. He goes, heathen people do that. That's like mantras. Don't do that. And I do the same thing. A lot of times when I'm driving, you know, um, different times of the day, I just start having a conversation with the Lord. Uh, but he says, truly, Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste all the nations and their lands. Lord, I see what they've done, and I'm, I'm a little unnerved about this. And have cast their gods into the fire, or the idols that they had made, for they were not gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore, they have destroyed them. Now, therefore, O Lord, our God, save us from his hand that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you are the Lord, you alone. So three is more threats from Assyria. And what is Hezekiah's response? Because we can learn a lot from this, right? Isaiah tells Hezekiah, everything is going to be okay. And then right after that, the Assyrians ramp up their threats. 
Look, how many of you, and, and you know, I can say for me as well, where you've gotten maybe a word from the Lord, you've got, I don't know, uh, accountability people, mentors, disciples telling you, you know, it's going to be okay. And after that conversation, it gets worse. And you start to, unfortunately, you start to trust your feelings over what you know to be true. You know what I'm saying? You start to, and again, we are trichotomous being, uh, body, mind, and spirit. And sometimes the spirit, our spirit is saying, you, you got to trust the Lord. This is what the scripture says. But our minds are racing. And we can get into these conflicts with ourselves, can't we? So, hey, it's going to get, it, it, it got, it's going to be okay. However, it gets worse before it gets better. I mean, how many of you have been threatened that somebody was going to destroy you? They were going to destroy your rep uh, reputation. They were going to physically assault you, but you're still here, right? Think about how you thought about that situation when you were in the midst of it, and then how now that you've been delivered from it, you're still here. You're sitting there, you're breathing, you're conscious, hopefully, and, uh, you know, that's a good thing, right? Verse 12, so, and this is, the, what they would do, too, is they would, uh, they would have representatives come out and meet in the field in a neutral place. Now we have uh, conferences in other countries where leaders of hostile nations meet, but they would meet in, in the field and they would address each other and they would take information from their bosses in the form of a scroll and hand it to the other delegation and they would send it. So this would kind of go back and forth, these scrolls that were changing hands, right? But in verse 12, it's true. The, the threat was, and again, how was it, two Sundays ago, I did the uh, message called psychological warfare, when we can get tripped up in our own thoughts, when we can get attacked by people and, and they uh, appear to be bigger than life, and it causes us to be unnerved. It's, it's, a, it's a strategy, it's a tactic, right? But verse 12, did the gods of the other nations save their people? And the answer is no. So the enemy was like, well, it's going to be the same thing with you. 100% of the towns that we've besieged, we got in. You're going to be no difference. So Hezekiah could either listen to the enemy and psych himself out, or he could listen to what God said through Isaiah. And he's honest with God in verse 18. He says to God in his prayer, up to this point, this has been true, God. This has been true, and I'm concerned. But Hezekiah does something a little bit different. So he would send, he would send Isaiah the prophet to, to inquire of the Lord, here, he takes the threatening scroll, and he opens it up. He goes into the temple, he opens it up, and says, Lord, do you see what they're saying? Look, the words are right here. And folks, sometimes we have to do that. You ever get a letter, or a threatening letter, or I don't know, it could be anything. And I've done it before, I'm like, you know what, Lord, here it is. I know you see it. So it's kind of neat, you got to act like Hezekiah. Lord, this is in your hands. I'm powerless in this situation, right? I believe Hezekiah was scared. Is it okay to be scared? Sure, it's okay to be scared. It's a human emotion. But what do we do when we're scared, right? He basically says, God, I know you're the only true God, and all these other gods of the other nations that were destroyed were just idols. I know that even though I haven't seen you, even though I haven't touched you, that I know that you're there. I know that you're real. I've, I've experienced you in different ways. So I'm, I'm putting all my trust in you. Remember, he's the king. He's the president, so to speak. This battle is yours. And I think it's good for a leader. It's good for a leader. And I've had different jobs. And I tell you what, I had more confidence in leaders that weren't so prideful, that didn't think they had all the answers, that couldn't take advices from their, uh, advice from their subordinates. I like a leader who's real and says, listen, I don't have all the answers. And then sometimes he or she goes to their subordinates and and they caucus about certain things. They, they pool ideas together. Pride goes before destruction, the Bible says. Give me somebody who's a, a human, who's real, who's genuine. That's the person that I want to serve under, who doesn't have all the answers all the time, because that's just a facade anyway. Now, historically, historically, and I covered the uh, Ethiopian Alliance back then, the North, actually the Northeast African Alliance, that were siding with God's people, which was good, but the people ended up relying too much on that, on that alliance than they relied on God, which was not good. So the rumor that the Assyrians hear is that while they're outside of Jerusalem trying to get in, 
that Tir Haka, the leader of the Ethiopian alliance, was going to rout and hit their weak flanks. And now they're fighting Jerusalem and they're fighting the Ethiopian alliance at the same time. So he panics. Okay? But he panics, but before he leaves, he sends another threatening letter to, to the Israelites. So verse 21, we continue. Then Isaiah, the son of Amos, sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, because you have prayed to me against Sennacherib, king of Assyria, this is the word which the Lord has spoken concerning him. Now, this was not only for the leadership of Jerusalem, but this also was meant to be written down. Obviously, we have a recording of it, and it was to be sent to the enemy. <laughs> and I can imagine the courier, oh, we have a message for you, and he just takes off because I'm sure it would have inflamed the enemy. Again, they were very bold, they were very prideful, they were very brazen, they were very cruel. But here's the message from God. The virgin, the daughter of Zion, has despised you, laughed you to scorn. The daughter of Jerusalem has shaken her head behind your back. Whom have you reproached and blasphemed? Against whom have you raised your voice and lifted up your eyes on high? Against the Holy One of Israel, God speaking of himself. By your servants you have reproached the Lord and said, by the multitude of my chariots, I have come to the height of the mountains, to the limits of Lebanon. I will cut down its tall cedars and its choice cypress trees. I will enter its farthest height to its fruitful forest. I have dug and drunk water, and with the soles of my feet I have dried up all the brooks of defense. Now, God is speaking to these leaders. Maybe the Israelites didn't know all this, but God sees everything. So through the scroll, he's speaking to the enemy, saying, I saw what you did. I know you went into Lebanon. I know you took their choice trees and you brought it back home. I know the wells that you dug. God is speaking to them. God's not really happy at this point. But he's giving them their own history. Pretty cool. Did you not hear long ago how I made it from ancient times that I formed it? Now I have brought it to pass that you should be for crushing fortified cities into heaps of ruins. Therefore, their inhabitants had little power. They were dismayed and confounded. They were as the grass of the field and as the green herb, as the grass on the housetops and as grain blighted, it is grown. But I know your dwelling place, you're going out and you're coming in and your rage against me because your rage against me and your tumult have come up to my ears. Therefore, I will put my hook in your nose and my bridle in your lips and I will turn you back by the way which you came. Four, God's response through Isaiah, through Hezekiah, and again, this response was also to the king of Assyria. Now, when you leave here, um, I just was talking to a, a Greco-Roman history major, and I met him for the first time. We had a really cool discussion, because I love history. And again, I've often proved God, the existence of God through, um, through science, uh, things were written before the microscope, the telescope, and the computer. So how God would know these things in the Old Testament, it's quite impossible because the technology wasn't there. That being said, I'm really starting to, for the last few years, really enjoy archaeology. And when you leave here, just put in your search engine, King Hezekiah discovery, prophet, you know, Isaiah the prophet discovery. In my office, I have a, a filing cabinet, and literally the file is this thick with papers that in the last 50 years, the archeological discoveries that people said, oh, that's just a pretend town in the Bible. King David never existed. The Philistines never existed. Boy, every time they put a shovel in the Holy Land, start digging stuff up, they find. And it's amazing, as I'm going through this study, I'm reading more and more. I, I just, some articles I don't even print out. There's just so many of them. Hezekiah, yes, he lived. These were the things he wrote. These, this was his insignia. This was his seal. Yes, Isaiah the prophet, yes. Again, you go into Jerusalem, you find their, their important papers and effects and their seals and such. And it's amazing. There's literally a mountain of evidence proving the things of God through archaeology. Why do I say this? Because this is a community church, and every, any given Sunday I have believers, seekers, and skeptics. So I always say, challenge me. Let's, let's debate it. Let's have this discussion. Pretty neat stuff. And basically, uh, when you look at this, it's kind of cool because 
If you remember the book of Job, now Job was a follower of God, but he was going through a trial, and what? His emotions started playing tricks on him. His friends gave him some bad advice. He started questioning God. When God was ready, he actually has a conversation with Job, and sort of very similar here. Were you there when I made the seas, when I delineated how much water is on the earth versus how much land? Were you there when I put the stars in the sky? Job is completely humbled and apologizes. Here, you have somebody, Sennacherib, who's hostile towards God, mocking God. And he goes, I see everything that you did. And you don't want to be on that side of God. He is merciful, he's loving, he's a good father, but he's also a disciplinarian. So this, you, see, you see things start to change here. So the picture, with, uh, it starts out with the young virgin with, virgin with confidence, really rebuffing the advances of the soldiers. Because unfortunately, there was no Geneva Convention, and these soldiers were barbaric, they were cruel, they were heartless. So here you see it's a, it's a metaphor of a young girl, virgin, who's shaking her head and she's kind of having an attitude with the soldiers and she can get away with it because her daddy's that powerful. You ever watch, um, and I love to see this recently, you ever watch like the videos, the YouTube videos of kids in the zoo? And there's one particular one that I saw, a little girl, about seven years old, and there's like three inch, I don't know, bulletproof glass separating her from the lions. And you see the lion, when the girl comes into that area, he's looking at her like lunch. You know, if there was no glass, she'd be gone in a few seconds. However, she's taunting the lion and he's scratching at the glass and he's, he's up on, on t- and it's kind of frightening to look at. And you realize that if that gl- glass wasn't there, that kid would be done. She's giggling, she's laughing, she's mocking the lion, and he's getting frustrated because he can't get what he thinks is a meal. So that being said, I look at God as the glass. You see what I'm saying, folks? And it could be the scariest person coming after you. And we need to pray, and we need to ask what his will is. Because a lot of the only thing sometimes separating us from a disaster is God. And I look at him as the glass in that situation. But God's saying to the Assyrians, I watched you rise to power. I allowed it to happen. I showed restraint. I showed patience. But I've seen your cruelty. I've seen your evil. I've seen your blasphemy. And I'm going to take you out. And he spoke about taking them out with hooks in their nose. Now, this is interesting and ironic. And I don't know what the, the, the bad king's response was when he read it. But you ever read something that kind of gives you like a little bit of an adrenaline rush? You read something and it's a threat and you realize, wow, they know more about me than I realized they knew about me. So he's saying to them, I see, I see how you remove people when you get into those cities. I, and what, what they do is uh, the Assyrians would take hooks, like fish hooks, and they would hold people down and put it through their nose or their lips and put chains. And the facial nerves are so sensitive That once that happened, a little tug, that person would go, even if their foot was falling off because of the pain that it would cause. If we can put up the first image, and again, talking about archaeology, this is Easter Haddon's steel, S-T-E-L-E, which is a 671 B.C. picture showing uh, showing the king, Easter Haddon, who came after Sennacherib, and he has a club in one hand. It's a little hard to see from where, you at, where you're at, but th- this is amazing when you see these. If you ever go to these museums and see it, if you're ever in England, go to the British Museum. There's a lot of these things there. And he's holding a chain. And of course, the guys aren't that little, but remember, it's a power thing. He conquered Tyr, Baalu of Tyr. He conquered uh, Tirhaka of the Ethiopian alliance which the Israelites were tempted to rely on, but these people were just vicious. They got in, and you can see the two guys, if you ever see it in person, the, uh, the hooks are in their nose and their lips. God's saying, you want to do that to people? Well, I'm going to take you figuratively, and I'm going to bring you back. I'm going to take you away. The bully, the mocker of God, will all face God one day. King Hezekiah and his cabinet were scared. They were startled, they were humbled, and they asked for help, and they repented and they prayed. And thankfully, the residents of Jerusalem had these people as leaders, right? Verse 30, we continue, and we're going to talk about what happens at the end. There's only a few verses left. Verse 30, it says, this shall be a sign to you. I know, again, we we did this with the healing of Hezekiah. 
um, God reveals something to us and we want all these signs because we're, we live in a tangible world. He said, this is the sign. This is the sign that what I'm telling you is going to come to pass. You shall eat this year such as grows of itself and the second year what springs from the same. Also in the third year sow and reap, plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. And the remnant who have escaped of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem shall go a remnant, and those who escape from Mount Zion, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. So five out of seven is the sign to Isaiah. And, I mean, it happens today, too, in in World War II. It was really, really sad what happened after, you know, everything was over. But the Russians did it. The Germans did it. It was called a scorched earth policy. And they would go through these city horrible things. Uh, They would burn houses down. They would burn fields down so people couldn't feed themselves. And if the army was advancing on them and they lost, that there was nothing to sustain the army, so hopefully they would stop their pursuit. So the Assyrians kind of did the same thing. They would trample the fields. They would steal the produce. They would uh, burn fields. And God was saying, "I I know it looks really bad, but I'm telling you that there's going to be a sign of a miraculous crop. Remember manna in the wilderness? The children of Israel, oh, we're going to die out here, Moses. How could you do this? There's no water. There's no food. Hey, even we were slaves of Egypt, but at least we got fed. We're going to die out here. God's like, I got this. Water, manna, right? What is it? (laughs) Hebrew, it meant this miracle bread, coriander-like kind of substance. Quails would, you know. So he sustained them. He did the same thing to them. Just trust me. Trust me. And I wonder sometimes, folks, in our society, because I hear this from people, well, how come we don't see miracles today? I'm going to tell you this, that I know a lot of missionaries, and there are some amazing, amazing miracles that God is doing to bring people to salvation. There are miracles done today. I've seen miracles. I've been a part of miracles. But I think that, unfortunately, in Western culture, we as a culture have seemed to rely so much on ourselves so much on technology, so much on our pride. And again, our culture is moving away from the things of God. You know that Jesus went through some towns and because, you know, he he was feeding people, he was doing miracles, raising the dead. He went through some towns and he left. Why? Because of their unbelief. And he said it right right in the Gospels. Okay. You know, God's, God is, he respects himself. If we don't want him in our lives and we push him out, he'll go. He gave us free will. So Jesus, in many of these towns, you know what's funny? I have this kind of, it's like a, almost like a legal binding that we would talk about today. It's called the first right of refusal. I have that with God. When it comes to, listen, we have good surgeons. I've had surgeons work on me, and thank God they didn't mess up. But, um, and I prayed for the surgeons, and I told them about Jesus. But first right of refusal, Lord, I'm just going to pray. If you want to fix it, great. And, and sometimes he has. Sometimes he's had me go through uh, more qualified people. And uh, one particular surgeon who did a lot of work on me uh, for sleep apnea in my nose, my throat and stuff, and I must have seen him a dozen times. And he secretly, <laughs> like Nicodemus, we would have discussions and he would go on the website and listen to the messages. He's a uh, very ultra-Orthodox Jewish person. But he was so tied into that community. I don't know if he's listening now or tomorrow. But uh, he he read a book I gave him about the Messiah. It was really it was a lot of fruit that came out of it. So I'm like, all right. I didn't enjoy the healing process. I didn't enjoy the surgery. But um, you know, I gave. I I see why God allowed me to go through that. So there's there's a lot of things that we just don't know that God is doing behind the scenes. I'll tell you about miracles too when I hear about Chuck Smith and even an older older than us, pastor and his wife, told us a story, my wife and I, about when they were completely destitute years ago. Uh, there, was so, there was less government safety nets, and they were starving, and they prayed, and this guy is not an embellisher. And a knock was at their door, and there was a long hallway in their apartment. They opened the door. There was three bags of food, and they heard no footsteps. They saw nobody walking away, and they swear that it was a miracle. It was an angel or something. But, you know, we, we have to get away from, listen, I'm a realist. I understand this. if there was an emergency, you have to take action. But there's also the way we live our lives. Do we believe God? Do we trust in him? 
Do we give him that first right of refusal? Do we allow him to come into our life where we're so busy and say, Lord, I'm just too busy. <laughs> I got things I got to do. And people may not say that with their lips, but they do it with their actions. They're too busy for God. Is your lifestyle too busy for God? I hope not, because this is an awesome God we serve, and he doesn't change. So, so what happens? Well, it, what's really good is that the nation is saved, and the crops, the seeds that fell, and the miracles that God did, they were able to feed themselves. And you know what? History bears that out. They were able to repel the Assyrians. They were able to feed themselves, and that really was a miracle, because that shouldn't have happened. Verse 33 through 35 it says, therefore, thus says the Lord, concerning the king of Assyria. Now, I'm going to tell you what happens to the army. I'm going to tell you what happens to you. I'm going to tell you what happens to the army. Now, let me tell you what happens to your enemy. God's very specific. He shall not come into the city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shield, nor build a siege mound against it. By the way that he came, by the same shall he return. And he shall not come into this city, thus says the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it for my own sake, and for my servant David's sake. So six out of seven is, how does the siege end? How does the siege end? Uh, that the Assyrians go leave the same way they came in. And God says, I'm going to defend this city. Why? Because the Messiah had to come through David's line, came through some of the people in Judah, and uh, that had to be preserved. The Assyrians would have made havoc of that, and that might have cut off that line. God's like, no, 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 this is going to be preserved. Um, the Babylonians came later, but they, the Babylonians and the Persians, I believe, treated their captors a lot better than the Assyrians did. Uh, so when we look at this, and, and of course the Babylonians came only because there was just this repetitive thing. Oh, everybody's rejoicing, they're happy about God. And then, unfortunately, over 100 years later, they become very decadent again. And God's like, I've got to remove my protective hand. So it's, it's interesting to watch this back and forth. Uh, so when we look at this, we also see that Sometimes God does things not because we're good, but because he's good. There's a very unusual kind of thing that happens in the Old Testament in Genesis 15, and God is making an agreement with Abraham. And Abraham's just a man. You know, there's, there's some promises that we make we just can't keep. You know what he does to Abraham in Genesis 15? He puts him to sleep. He puts him under anesthesia. <laughs> he's sleeping. And God does this thing with the sacrifices and he promises his, his descendants certain things, and he makes this covenant with Abraham, but Abraham is not even conscious. And then he wakes Abraham up, and he tells him what he did. Because God is good. Because he knew that Abraham would probably mess up, as he's done before. So he makes this covenant. It's a one-sided deal. That's the beauty of God. And people think, you know, I, I shouldn't go to church, and I shouldn't consider even being with those people, you know, and they, they look down on themselves. God is such a forgiving, merciful and patient God. Keep that in mind. Last few verses. Verse 36. Then the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000. And when people arose early in the morning, there were the corpses all dead. Remember, these soldiers were very, very cruel, cruel people. So don't feel sorry for them. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went away returned home and remained at Nineveh. A lot of excavations at Nineveh, by the way. Now it came to pass, it's in, in the Iraq, uh, I believe it's northern Iraq. Now it came to pass as he was worshiping in the house of Nisroch, his god, that Adremelech and Sherazar, his sons, struck him down with the sword, and they escaped into the land of Ararat. Then Esar had and his son reigned in this place. Seven is, how does the story end? Well, God gives warning after warning after warning, but the cruelty and the sin has come up to him, and now he takes out 185,000 of the Assyrian army, just slays them, wipes them out. The king then goes back home, and he's assassinated in the temple of his false god by two of his sons. They kill him. Interesting. This is irony, and this is poetic justice. Sennacherib boasted that the true God could not save Jerusalem. Well, he was wrong. And the ironic thing was his God, his false God, couldn't save him. He's worshiping in this false temple, and his sons kill him. Another irony is that Sennacherib was too busy meddling in the lives of other people, of foreigners, 
while apparently not giving attention to his kids at home. Imagine that. Two, two sons rise up and they stab you to death. Eh, that's a very vicious crime. So if we could put up the second image, and then we'll close. This is the Taylor Prism, and this is also in the British Museum. Again, if you're there was a point in time where a lot of excavation happened, and the Brits were something with their archaeological. A lot, of, a lot of people do archaeology today, but there are the British Museum has all these rooms, and it's just amazing what they've excavated from different parts of the world in the biblical area. And these, this is the, uh, the king. It, it, it's, it's hard to see, but that's the way they did their, you know, today we have flash drives and we save things in folders. Well, this is the way that they spoke about their pursuits and their conquerings and things like that. Again, the Taylor Prism. This is Sennacherib. Uh, he speaks about, now I'm at Jerusalem. So he talks about conquering all these people. And he's like, I'm paraphrasing. Now I'm at Jerusalem, and I got Hezekiah like a bird in the cage. And then it ends. Because the Assyrians were so prideful that they never spoke about their defeats. So... History and archaeology back up everything that the Scripture says. He never got into Jerusalem. He died an inglorious or ignominious or shameful death for a world leader who doesn't have God. When tragedy strikes, we've all been there. What do we do? Some of you might be going through it right now. I've preached sermons and people have come up to me and said, that definitely was for me. Hezekiah experienced tragedy, and he and his cabinet humbled themselves and sought the Lord. Good lesson for us. The doctrine of the remnant, verse 31. There's always a remnant. Jesus spoke about the world, sadly enough, with their free will, that on the wide road, most people in the world take the wide road that leads to destruction. It's, a, it's an eternity without God. He says, few take the narrow road that leads to eternal life. You might be that remnant, that person taking the narrow road. And I want to encourage you, actually, a lot of people have prayed the situation, their households or um, their peer groups, their professional groups, um, even their Christian friends who are so caught up in the world that they're really not following God. You might be that remnant. You might that be in that minority, right? Stand firm. Stand strong. Whatever comes your way, sometimes it's just the enemy's attack on you because you're doing the right thing, because you're a light in those different areas. The situation seemed impossible. It was bleak. It was terrifying. But they were children of God. They humbled themselves and they sought the Lord. What would have happened if they didn't? It might have turned out differently. God is real. When we go through things that are terrifying, bleak, that seem impossible, we're still God's children. And God's MO, so to speak, doesn't change. How he loved his people and how he was concerned for them and how he led them and cared for them, he's the same way with us. So I want to encourage you, the next time we're in a situation like that, remember what King Hezekiah did, and remember what the prophet Isaiah did. Let's pray.